I'm happy to be here and, and uh, uh, delighted to have a chance to talk to you about uh, Harry Truman. And uh, as you might expect from someone who has the position of director of a, a presidential library for Harry Truman, uh, my views of, of President Truman are a little bit more positive than many of those uh, in Korea uh, who have a, a more positive view of MacArthur than they do of, of Harry Truman. Um, I, I was uh, intrigued by the, the little poster I saw outside the door uh, advertising this talk. And uh, it not only mentioned what the topic would be and the talk and all that, but it also said that, that there would be pizza. And uh, I asked where the pizza was. And uh, I was told that it served after the talk. So this puts a lot of pressure on me, knowing that I'm the only thing standing between you and free pizza. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it as, as painless as, as possible. Uh, in 1970, oh, uh, let me point out that, that this is a momentous day in, uh, uh, the, in Korean history and in the, the history of the Korean War because this is September 15th. And this is the uh, 60th anniversary of the landing at Incheon, which uh, uh, turned the tide, at least temporarily, in the Korean War and certainly saved uh, the Republic of Korea or, or South Korea from domination by the North. And 40 years ago, uh, in 1970, uh, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Korea and I was assigned to a, a Jesuit university in Korea called Sogan University. In fact, in, in honor of this being a Jesuit university, I wore my my Sogan University tie. If anyone would like a closer look later on, I'll be happy to, to show it off. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, when I was at uh, Sogan University, uh, Father John Daly, who was Professor Beck's predecessor as the head of the uh, Asian Business Center, it was the president of Sogan University. Well, at any rate, in March of 1970, I went to Incheon with some students because I was curious to see this site of this great uh, landing uh, this amphibious landing uh, at this very dangerous location, this port city where uh, uh, MacArthur and uh, his forces, uh, including South Korean forces and other UN forces, had uh, turned back the North Korean invasion. And there over the, on a cliff, or a large hill, overlooking the harbor of Incheon and the, and the little port city was this monumental statue of Douglas MacArthur. And I said to the students who were with me, I said, well, that's a really impressive statue of Douglas MacArthur, but they really ought to put a statue of Harry Truman up there as well. And the students said, oh, no, no, well, no, we wouldn't put a statue of Truman up there. Truman was bad. It's because of Harry Truman that Korea is divided. And I said to the students, well, that may be true. You know, they said he fired MacArthur, and MacArthur would have unified Korea. And I said, well, maybe. But I said, the fact of the matter is, on June 25th, 1950, it was Truman who made the critical decision to send MacArthur's forces to defend Korea in the first place. And if Truman hadn't made that decision in, 19, in June of 1950, Korea would be united all right, but it would be united under the forces from the North. Well, let me talk a little bit about the background and what led up to the Korean War. This is Harry Truman at Potsdam in July of 1945, uh, seeking to, to continue the uh, coalition that had won the war in Europe, the coalition between the British, the Soviet Union, and, and the United States. Uh, Japan had still not yet been defeated, and it appeared that the defeat of Japan might be as long, as far off as, as another year. In fact, the defeat of Japan was only weeks away uh, because of the uh, use of the atomic bombs uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In September of 1945, the Japanese formally surrendered. Uh, there's Douglas MacArthur on the, as you look at it, on the left of the picture. Uh, observing the proceedings on the deck of the battleship Missouri. The battleship Missouri was used because Harry S. Truman, 
was now the president after Franklin Roosevelt had died in April. Missouri was his home state. The end of World War II, uh, the surrender of the Japanese, didn't bring about uh, universal peace throughout East Asia. The critical uh, issue, uh, besides rebuilding of Japan, was a civil war that emerged in China. Uh, Truman hoped to resolve this civil war between nationalist forces under Chiang Kai-shek and communist forces in some kind of peaceful negotiation, some kind of coalition government. He sent his most trusted military advisor, soon to be Secretary of State, George C. Marshall. You see Marshall here uh, with uh, General Chiang Kai-shek. There's General Marshall in the middle with uh, Zhou Enlai on the left, and Zhu Te, the uh, Communist uh, Forces military uh, commander um, on the, well, Zhou Enlai's being left, Zhu Te on the right. The uh, uh, negotiations were uh, not successful, and uh, in 1949, uh, the communist forces took over uh, all of China. This had a, a tremendous impact on, on Korea and its future. In 1945, at the end of the Korean War, or at the end of the, of the Second World War, it was determined that Soviet forces coming in from the north, from Manchuria, from uh, eastern China, would accept the surrender of Japanese forces in Korea north of the 38th parallel, and American forces would accept the surrender of those forces south of the 38th parallel. Why the 38th parallel? Some State Department officials looked at a map. The 38th parallel seemed to cut across the middle of the country. It seemed convenient. The Soviet Union had only entered the war for the last two weeks of the war. Actually, that they, they entered the same uh, day that the uh, uh, atomic bombs, the first of the atomic bombs was, was dropped on Hiroshima. But nevertheless, the, the Soviets felt, because of the heavy lifting they had done throughout the Second World War against Nazi Germany, uh, that they were uh, entitled to uh, a, a say in how uh, events in East Asia uh, unfolded once the war came to a, a close. It was thought that the 38th parallel would be a temporary dividing line and that Korea would be unified under some sort of coalition government. Uh, here we see some uh, uh, welcoming uh, United States forces uh, into Seoul. This next slide, um, when the Koreans found out that the United States and other nations that had in the recently formed United Nations, we're talking about a United Nations trusteeship governing Korea for maybe three or four or five decades until Korea would achieve full independence. Um, uh, riots broke out and, and uh, there was a great deal of anti-American feeling. Uh, Korea had been occupied by Japan for 35 years prior to 1945. But Korea had a long history of independence, and the Koreans felt they were quite ready uh, to govern themselves. There were several problems, however. Uh, most of the Korean leaders, potential leaders for a new independent Korea, had lived outside of Korea for many decades. Uh, the leader of North Korea, who came in with the Soviets, uh, Kim Il-sung, uh, was, was probably born in Manchuria and never even entered Korea until the war was over. Uh, the South Korean leader who emerged with American support, Lee Sigman, here we see him pictured, uh, had been living in exile from Korea uh, for nearly 40 years. He had been exiled by the Japanese for his uh, anti-Japanese activities. In fact, as a young man, here he is at uh, Princeton University, uh, when he was exiled, he put himself to good use. He attended Princeton University and completed his bachelor's, master's, and doctorate, all in a period of five years. Uh, how many tuition-paying parents would be happy if their children would just finish a bachelor's degree in five years? Um, 
I know some who would be. So, um, but anyway, this is E. Sigman. This is his, uh, actually the home that he occupied uh, in Korea uh, after he returned to Korea in 1945, an interior of his home. This is uh, some uh, material that Isigman, that's on display at the home uh, of Isigman. It, you can still visit this site uh, in, uh, in Korea, in Seoul. Uh, when Isigman was a young man, he was imprisoned by the Japanese, uh, placed in solitary confinement, and he was actually at one point even condemned to death. So he had bona fide credentials as a, as a leader. He, he had been a, uh, an anti-Japanese uh, freedom fighter. Uh, during his imprisonment and his, in solitary confinement, he decided that to, to keep his mind sharp, to keep himself occupied, uh, he would create uh, an English-Korean dictionary. So he wrote down all the English words he could think of in alphabetical order and then began to, to write uh, uh, his own uh, translations or his own uh, interpretations of those words. And uh, in my view of his uh, work, he, it looks like he got up to about K or L before he was released and then uh, the, the Japanese exiled him from Korea. This is the uh, North Korean uh, leader who emerged with Russian support. Uh, Kim Il-sung, uh, known in North Korea as the great leader, was a young man probably about 40 years old, uh, had probably served in the Soviet army. It's not clear whether he served in the Soviet army on the Eastern Front or the Western Front, but certainly he had been trained in, in communist ideology and communist tactics. Uh, was uh, uh, steeped in, in Soviet-style communist uh, ideology and was very ambitious to unify uh, the country uh, under uh, a communist uh, regime, just as determined as Yi Sigman, who emerged as the leader in South Korea, was determined to unify South Korea under a kind of uh, democratic, capitalist, free market type of, of government. This is not to say that, that Yi Sigman was uh, uh, not a, an authoritarian leader. Uh, certainly many of the people who surrounded Yi Sigman, the South Korean leader, were quite uh, ruthless. Um, some of them were, were downright corrupt. Uh, but that they were indeed uh, uh, closer to a, a democratic uh, form of government uh, than, than their counterparts in North Korea. In 1948, elections were scheduled by the United Nations to be held throughout the Korean Peninsula, both north and south of the uh, uh, 38th parallel. The, the Soviet-dominated North Korean regime under Kim Il-sung would not allow elections to take place in North Korea. They were held in South Korea. Observers determined them to be fairly democratic. Um, a few glitches. Hey, I, I grew up in Illinois, you know, where we've seen elections in Chicago. So glitches in elections are something that that happens in, in democracies. And but there, there, while there were abuses, I think it's pretty clear that E. Sigmund, under any circumstances, uh, would have won. Uh, popular support in South Korea and probably North Korea as well. In the, the time that continued between 1948 and June of 1950, E. Sigmund made several pro public proclamations uh, claiming that he was prepared to attack the North and unify the country by force. This worried the United States and in, in 1949, we began to withdraw military assistance and left the South Korean government without heavy tanks and without aircraft. Uh, the reason for this was the United States wanted stability on the Korean Peninsula, didn't want a, a war that might involve China, might lead to a larger confrontation, and we were concerned about the, the volatility of E. Sigmund. Of course, this left South Korea vulnerable to an attack from the North. And by 1950, the North had received heavy armor from the Soviet Union, 
new new guns uh, the the uh, uh, AK-47 uh, they had received the uh, uh, also um, a jet a new jet aircraft uh, and the assistance of, of Russian pilots to to fly those aircraft on the uh, uh, Sunday morning, June 25th, 1950, North Korean forces attacked the South in force. There had been skirmishes along the border for years, different raids, reconnaissance, nasty guerrilla fighting uh, in South Korea with infiltrators who had been, and, and organizers who had been sent from the North. And when the word first reached Harry Truman, he was at that, at, uh, that, that Sunday morning, was still Saturday evening in Independence, Missouri. And Truman was just about to go to bed. It was about 10 o'clock at night. He was a guy who went to bed early and got up very early. The phone rang. It was Secretary of, of State Dean Acheson telling him that the North Koreans had invaded. At first, Truman thought, well, maybe this was another border skirmish. In fact, Acheson and, and his aides in the State Department had been looking at the cables all day. And it's fascinating in the Truman Library to read these cables going back and forth. What is it? Is this really another border skirmish? Is this an all-out attack? Can the South Korean forces hold? Can E. Sigmund's government maintain itself in Seoul? And, it, and within a few hours, it, it became clear uh, that the attack by the North Koreans was an all-out invasion aimed at unifying the Korean Peninsula. We now know from documents released from the Soviet Union, uh, once the Soviet Union fell, from the Soviet archives released by the Russian government during the 1990s, that, e -Sigma, that uh, Kim Il-sung had met several times with both Joseph Stalin and Mao Zedong in 48, 49, and early 1950, seeking permission, seeking their support to attack the South, promising that if the South were attacked, he would be able to defeat the Southern forces within a matter of weeks, that his forces from the North would be met with popular uh, support, and that, that the uh, government of E. Sigmund, which was a puppet government, he claimed, uh, of the United States uh, would soon collapse and, and run off into exile. Well, in fact, that didn't happen because of a decision made immediately by Harry Truman to commit American forces to Korea. This is a photograph from the Truman Library of Truman uh, in, uh, on June 27th uh, after a meeting with his cabinet. Truman always maintained that of all the decisions he made as president, which included a number of pretty momentous decisions at the end of World War II. He always maintained that the decision to send American troops to Korea was the most difficult he made. He made it very quickly, but clearly he knew he would be putting American soldiers in harm's way. And in fact, nearly 36,000 Americans uh, died in, in, in combat during the Korean War. This uh, illustration shows the, the conduct of the war. In the first week, the, the North Koreans uh, drove the, uh, the South Koreans and the, UN, and the United States forces down into the far southeastern corner of the, st of the state of, the, of South Korea, the Republic of Korea, uh, into an area called the Pusan perimeter, an area right around Pusan. Then you can see in, about in the middle of the peninsula, the large arrow showing where the, the Incheon landing uh, took place in, uh, uh, on, again, exactly 60 years ago uh, today on September 15th. And by this time, the South Korean uh, forces were, were beginning to regroup, reorganize themselves. The North Korean forces had overextended their supply lines all the way down the Korean Peninsula. I mean, the, the Korea itself, the north and south together, it's about the size of California. So where Incheon would be, I guess it would be like San Francisco, kind of right in the, right in the middle of the, uh, of the country. Uh, it's the port city of Seoul. Uh, many of the North Korean forces were stranded south of Incheon, cut off from their uh, main uh, supply routes. Uh, thousands were captured. Others made their way back to the north as best they could. 
the United States Secretary of Defense, who was now uh, uh, General George C. Marshall, had been brought back into government, authorized MacArthur to pursue the North Koreans north of the 38th parallel. The opportunity seemed ripe for unification of all of Korea by force. The North Korean military had largely collapsed. This is MacArthur uh, in the old uh, Capitol building in Seoul, uh, announcing the, the victory uh, and the restoration of the government of East Sigman, who you see seated, seated behind uh, MacArthur. Actually, there was still fighting going on in Seoul when he made that uh, pronouncement, but uh, it was, MacArthur was never one to miss a good opportunity for publicity. Uh, Harry Truman, I, I think it's fair to say, wanted some of the publicity himself and wanted to identify his administration with what appeared to be a winning situation in Korea. In October, he flew to Wake Island. MacArthur said he was too busy conducting the war to come back all the way to Washington to brief Truman. So Truman met him kind of halfway, I guess Truman went two thirds of the way, to meet with MacArthur and discuss the situation in Korea. At that meeting, Truman wanted assurances from MacArthur that if the UN forces approached the Yalu River, which was the border between North Korea and the People's Republic of China, that the, that the Chinese forces would not intervene. Truman made it very clear he did not want to get involved in a land war with China, a war that, that might spread, might involve the Soviet Union, could possibly lead to a third world war. MacArthur assured Truman that the Chinese would not dare intervene. If they did, that he, MacArthur, had, and the UN forces. MacArthur now was operating under not just American orders, but a United Nations resolution, uh, although there was no declaration of war by the United States. There was a UN resolution. Uh, and that the, the UN forces with their aircraft would be able to stop any uh, Chinese communist advance. Here's Truman meeting with his uh, key advisors. He's talking to, on the, from left to right, it's Averill Harriman, uh, General George C. Marshall. Atchison is next. That's uh, John Snyder, who was uh, Secretary of the Treasury next to him. Oh, and uh, the only person kind of looking at the camera with a little pose there is, that's General uh, Omar Bradley, who was Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Well, MacArthur was wrong. The Chinese did intervene, and they intervened with over a quarter million troops. Uh, they did not come with heavy armor. They came in, in small units on mountain trails, uh, cut off American, South Korean, and UN units, uh, and forced a, a hasty retreat by American and UN forces uh, with the South Korean forces south of the 38th parallel, in fact, all the way south of, of uh, Seoul. At this point, MacArthur claimed that uh, he didn't admit that he had been wrong. He simply said, we're now in a whole new war with the Chinese intervene, intervening in the war. And because of this, the United States had to increase its military commitment. He argued that forces of Chiang Kai-shek, which had been exiled or fled to, to Taiwan, uh, be allowed to attack China, and that possibly uh, uh, nuclear weapons might need to be used to stop the, uh, the communist advance uh, from, from China, and that Chinese and even Soviet air bases in Manchuria uh, should be bombed to keep those uh, uh, air bases from supporting uh, uh, the, the Chinese forces that were entering South Korea. Uh, Truman publicly uh, assured the American people that he did not want a larger war. His aim was to avoid uh, uh, a third world war. And the, the split between MacArthur and Truman soon became uh, obvious. In fact, this uh, political cartoon illustrates that, showing the, the eagle with, uh, with two heads. Here's another uh, political cartoon. Uh, this is, uh, there was a, a famous uh, 
uh, comedian Edgar Bergen with his, uh, his puppet was Charlie McCar McCarthy. And this shows General MacArthur with the puppet uh, MacArthur, the, there's the MacArthur the general and MacArthur the, uh, the politician. Uh, MacArthur, uh, it seemed, uh, had designs on the 1952 presidential uh, nomination. Uh, he had ties with many prominent Republicans. And in a number of cases, MacArthur made his, uh, his political views uh, known and uh, made his uh, disagreements with Truman uh, known to members of Congress, several of whom published some of the correspondence they had with MacArthur. After MacArthur was warned about this, he continued to do it, and MacArthur uh, finally got to the point where Truman felt um, he, he had no uh, alternative but to uh, dismiss the general, which uh, uh, took place in, in March of, of 1945, well, April, 40, uh, April of 1951, excuse me. So, Here's uh, Truman's own diary. Uh, Truman was kind of a sporadic diary keeper. He always kept a diary when he had, or he wrote in his diary when he had a particularly good day or a particularly bad day. And here on the, uh, as you're looking at the left-hand page, MacArthur shoots another political bomb or something like that through Joe Martin. Joe Martin was the Republican leader in the House. so. This is Truman writing in his own diary that he's basically had enough of what he considers to be General MacArthur's insubordination. And this is the, the letter, uh, originally top secret, uh, to General MacArthur, uh, dismissing him of all of his commands uh, in, uh, uh, in East Asia. Because of MacArthur's popularity uh, built during the Second World War, because of his uh, 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 political connections, uh, there was immediate outrage that MacArthur had been fired, not just in South Korea, but throughout the United States. Uh, Truman's uh, White House was overwhelmed with uh, letters from uh, the American people. Uh, how can you fire this great general right in the middle of, of a war? There were even, as you can see, uh, in this political cartoon uh, uh, demonstrates this, uh, calls for Truman's impeachment. MacArthur returned to the United States to ticker tape parades, enormous uh, uh, popular receptions. He made a, a, an appearance before a joint session of Congress where he gave a very emotional speech uh, concluding by saying that old soldiers never die, uh, they just fade away. Well, of course, MacArthur had no intention of fading away. He was seeking the 1952 Republican presidential nomination, but he failed to get it. He, 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 he did fade away, but not, not because he wanted to. Um, uh, as he continued to talk about the war and how it should be conducted, it turned out most Americans really didn't want an expanded war, really didn't want a third world war uh, over the issue of Korea. Um, MacArthur lacked uh, political skills, uh, was totally unaware of domestic political issues, and uh, uh, his uh, attempt for the Republican Party's nomination uh, soon just dissipated. Meanwhile, the war went on. Uh, both uh, uh, sides, the Communist North and the UN ROK forces to the south, uh, dug in along what was more or less the 38th parallel uh, on mountains and streams, a, a more rugged uh, terrain you probably couldn't find uh, anywhere in the world. And, uh, but in the summer of 1951, negotiations began looking at a ceasefire, uh, an armistice, and, and a, a permanent settlement to the Korean War. The negotiations took place in a little village in, the demil in what was called a demilitarized zone at that point, and it's still a demilitarized zone, uh, along uh, the, 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 the front lines that had been established. This is a political cartoon again. The, the, the negotiations dragged on from 1951 
throughout 1952 and into mid-1953 before an armistice was reached. Here's a uh, uh, political cartoon showing the two sides coming together and the, the negotiators becoming very, very old uh, during these uh, uh, protracted negotiations. Uh, the main stumbling block in the negotiations was the issue of POWs. At the end of the Second World War, the United States had agreed to an international convention that all prisoners of war should be returned to their countries following the end of hostilities. But it soon became apparent that many of the POWs held by UN forces in South Korea didn't want to return to Communist China or the People's Republic of China or didn't want to return to North Korea. In fact, many of them, uh, many of the, the Chinese prisoners of war were really nationalist soldiers who had been fighting for Chiang Kai-shek. They were surrendered by their officers in 1949, conscripted into the communist uh, people's, uh, the, the army of the people's uh, uh, army of, of uh, the People's Republic of China and sent to fight in Korea and they knew that their families were actually in Taiwan, so they didn't want to go back to China. Um, and many of, the South, many of the North Koreans were not really North Koreans. They were South Koreans who had been conscripted, forced into the North Korean army, and of course they didn't want to go back to North Korea because they were already South Koreans. Or they were North Koreans who were disillusioned with the communist regime and wanted to stay in South Korea. This became a, a, a very uh, contentious issue. There were riots in the prison camps. There were uh, both pro-democracy and pro-communist elements in the prison camps. Some gangs formed trying to uh, influence uh, the various prisoners. Uh, there were propaganda leaflets. This is one that was produced by the North Koreans in the, uh, in the prison camp. Another problem uh, in reaching a peace agreement was that Lee Sigman, the leader of South Korea, again, in many ways, a, a brilliant guy, a visionary guy, but a gentleman who was extremely stubborn and difficult to work with, was determined that the Republic of Korea and the UN forces should continue fighting until Korea was unified. The United States, however, by this point, by 1953, was determined not to expend the capital, both financial and human, that would be required to bring about the unification of Korea. The United States and its allies, and the United States had to take the allies very seriously. NATO had just been formed in 1949, and the opinion of NATO allies, particularly Britain and France, was very important. The United States was not prepared uh, to continue the fight. This is some American officers meeting with East Sigmund, uh, giving him the bad news that a peace agreement uh, would be signed in uh, July of 1953. I say a peace agreement, it's really a, a ceasefire agreement. It's an armistice. There is still no treaty ending the Korean War, and technically both sides have uh, remained at war since June of 1950. This is a page from Harry Truman's memoirs. And uh, in it, uh, Truman uh, explains his views on East Asia and the Korean War. Truman, unlike MacArthur and unlike E. Sigman, is looking at the larger world picture the allies in Europe, the Marshall Plan, the need, if we're going to check Soviet expansionism worldwide, we can't get bogged down in East Asia. We need to look at, at Europe. Whether he's still, whether an American leader would still feel that way today, that Europe is the key to world peace, maybe not. But I present this to show you Truman's feelings at this point. Well, let me talk about, just to sum up, the four critical decisions that Truman made during the Korean War and how they, these decisions still have influence on our world today. In June 
On June 25th of, of 1950, Truman made a critical decision to support the Republic of Korea, a government that had been established under United Nations auspices in 1948 through uh, an election. Truman felt that the attack by the North Koreans was not just an effort by the Soviet Union to expand its power in East Asia, but was really an, an attempt to discredit and destroy the United Nations. Truman had fought as an artillery captain in World War I. He was a great supporter of Woodrow Wilson. And Truman felt that had the League of Nations, which Wilson supported uh, uh, at the end of World War I, had the United States joined the League of Nations, had that been a viable organization in the 1930s, the aggressiveness of Mussolini, Hitler, the Japanese Empire, that could have been held in check. And Truman still, in, 19, in, in, in 1950, had great hopes for the United Nations and felt that the United Nations couldn't survive if a stand wasn't made to um, halt aggression against a member nation uh, of the United Nations. Um, I think that, that uh, the United States' reliance on the United Nations has, has gone through several machinations uh, in the uh, decades, the six decades since the outbreak of the Korean War, but the United Nations is still there. And whether the United Nations would still be in existence today as a viable international body, um, I think is, is highly questionable. If it, if it would have survived had not Truman made the decision he made in, ni in 1950. When China entered the war, Truman made it very clear to his cabinet, to his military advisors, and to General Douglas MacArthur that he did not want the war to be expanded into a larger confrontation that might lead to uh, conflict with the Soviet Union uh, the use of nuclear weapons, and possibly a third world war. The second world war had cost 55 million lives. And Truman was very aware, very aware that a third world war involving nuclear weapons might cost four or five times that many lives. I think a lot of Americans at the time Truman, of Truman's presidency, felt that the United States always fought for unconditional surrender. That had been the, the, the terms that we insisted on against fascist Italy, Nazi Germany, the empire of Japan. But in fact, almost all of our wars have been fought for limited goals, limited objectives. In some cases, the War of 1812 to return to the status quo before the war. Uh, in uh, the war with Spain, we didn't fight for Spanish unconditional surrender. After six months, we looked for terms. Uh, we acquired some territory. We gave Spain some money. There was a negotiated deal. So I think that, that coming on the heels of uh, the Second World War, Americans had come to expect total victory. and didn't understand that uh, returning to the status quo antebellum, the situation that existed before the war began, that that is sometimes uh, a, a, a victory and that, that limited wars tend to be the, the norm uh, rather than an exception. With regard to the dismissal of MacArthur, while it was widely unpopular at the time, over the last six decades, Almost universally, military historians have looked upon Truman's decision as a landmark instance in which civilian control was reasserted over the military. I think it was interesting uh, in the last couple months when President Barack Obama dismissed uh, General uh, Stanley McChrystal uh, for intemperate uh, comments uh, 
to uh, in, in Rolling Stone magazine, in which Crystal made criticisms of, of not only President Obama, but some of his cabinet members, that McChrystal was immediately, well, fairly quickly, I should say, dismissed. But there was very little outcry against that dismissal. And I don't think that would be the case if it wasn't for the actions that Harry Truman took uh, in dismissing General Douglas MacArthur in 1951. On the prisoners of war issue, this is a pretty murky uh, business. Um, and the Korean War was one of several conflicts the United States has become involved in since World War II in which Congress has not declared war. So you might ask, well, how can you have prisoners of war without a declaration of war? Congress uh, uh, was never asked by the Truman administration uh, for any kind of resolution, any kind of, of authorization, much less a declaration of war. This was a political mistake on Truman's part, which subsequent presidents kept in mind. Because once the situation in Korea went badly, Congress was quick to label the Korean conflict as Mr. Truman's war. So when the United States built up in Vietnam, uh, President Lyndon Johnson had the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. Uh, President George H.W. Bush, when soldiers were sent to fight in Iraq the, uh, the, for the first Iraq war, there was a congressional resolution. There was also a UN resolution for the first Iraq war. The only two UN resolutions authorizing war, one was the, the uh, Korean War, the other uh, President George H.W. Bush in 1991. Uh, and of course, the, the second uh, Iraq war uh, President uh, George W. Bush uh, got a congressional authorization. And interestingly now, we, we don't even have in the current wars, which we call wars, although they're not officially declared wars, we don't have prisoners of war. Now we have enemy combatants who, were, who we are holding. And uh, so, um, the legacy of the Korean War in this issue is, is kind of murky. Well, let me just conclude here by, by saying that in 1952, President Truman uh, found himself uh, receiving the lowest public approval ratings of any president. Uh, approval ratings had just begun uh, about a decade earlier, and Truman held the record for the lowest public approval ratings of any president. He held that record until 2008, when the record was snatched from him by uh, President uh, George uh, W. Bush. Um, interestingly, however, Truman is now considered one of our five or six greatest presidents. And when historians, political scientists, journalists, respond to these uh, polls where they rank the presidents. And why, do, why does Truman get ranked with Lincoln and Washington and the, the two Roosevelts? And the reasons are exactly those decisions that he made regarding Korea, to send the troops in the first place, to maintain it as a limited war, to dismiss General MacArthur. These are all given as as reasons why Truman should be ranked as one of our greatest presidents, although at the time uh, uh, these decisions were not very popular. Well, the, the statue of General MacArthur still overlooks the bay at Incheon. Uh, I visited it recently this spring. Uh, Incheon is not the same city it was 40 years ago when I visited that, that small little dusty uh, port town. Um, but there's still no statue of General Douglas, Mac of, of, there is a statue of Douglas MacArthur, there is still no statue of Harry Truman. And uh, I think, as uh, Professor Beck pointed out earlier, that that view is changing, and uh, uh, maybe uh, at some point in 
in the near future, Koreans will rank uh, President Harry Truman as highly as Americans rank him. So thank you very much.